Welcome everybody, this is Dr. Bruce Perry and I'm here to spend uh, some time with you talking about uh, state-dependent functioning. Uh, state-dependent functioning is one of the core concepts that's used in uh, the neurosequential model and I think uh, if I have an opportunity to explain it a little bit uh, and share some of our work with you, uh, you'll find that it's helpful for your work as well. Um, we've been using this concept for many years uh, to try and uh, teach clinicians, educators, uh, people in the corporate sector, people in law enforcement, uh, all about how human functioning, particularly human brain functioning, will shift uh, as your internal state shifts. And uh, let me take a little bit of time to explain this to you. Um, first of all, uh, let me just put this slide up, kind of walk you through this. I think everybody knows that, that the human body has hundreds of really complex and important systems, including many, many systems in the human brain. And all of these systems have a certain dynamic activity. There's times when they're on, there's times when they're off. Uh, and part of what is really important about our, our bodies and that gives us so much of our flexibility and, and adaptability is the ability to, to turn certain systems on and other systems off in a way that's appropriate for the context, for the situation. Uh, so there'll be times when, when our body is resting and we're asleep and there's all kinds of parts of the brain that are less active and some parts of the brain that are more active. And the same thing's true about our muscles and our liver and our heart. And we, we were, we're able to turn on systems to meet demand and, and make them less active when we need to rest them. And this is a really important part of, of our bodies. Now, what that means is that your ability to use any or to demonstrate any capability is going to shift depending upon your internal state. And one of the things that we know shifts your, your internal state dramatically is threat and fear. And so let's talk a, a little bit about that. This is the basic uh, what kind of model that we use to talk about this. And uh, I'm going to draw on this a little bit to explain this slide. We use this a lot when we're teaching people about the brain. Obviously, the brain's much more complex than this simple diagram, but the, uh, the point we are trying to make here is that there's a hierarchical uh, organization to the brain, that uh, different parts of the brain mediate different functions, and as you go from the lower, more regulatory parts of the brain up to the highest, most complex part of the brain, which we call the cortex, you go from simpler to more complex functions. And the cortex is a part of the brain that's involved in the most uniquely human characteristics, the ability for speech and language, for example, and the ability to be reflective and inventive and creative, to reflect on past experiences and to anticipate future uh, events. This is all a, uh, mediated by complex systems in the cortex. Now, other parts of the brain, of course, aid with all of that. And it's important to remember that the brain works sort of as an integrated whole. But what we do know is that the, the brain also has these really, really important core regulatory networks that originate in lower parts of the brain. And some of these networks use neurotransmitters that you're familiar with, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. And, and collectively, all of these core regulatory networks are able to reach every single part of the brain and influence either mediating or modulating all brain mediated functions. Thinking, feeling, behaving, moving, perceiving, all of those things are influenced to some degree by these core regulatory networks. Furthermore, these networks influence all the rest of our body. They directly send connections through the autonomic nervous system to heart, lung, gut, 
and indirectly they influence our body and brain by releasing hormones. There's the neuroendocrine system and the neuroimmune system and all of these collectively help communication uh, throughout the whole body. The key point here is that because of this ubiquitous distribution and the ability to almost immediately influence function across multiple areas of the brain and body, these core regulatory networks are the backbone for the stress response. Now, if you look at this same image, uh, the same basic uh, model, but you look at uh, what's coming in to that part of the body, it's important to remember that we're continually monitoring our world. We've got sensory apparatus that are hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, all the things that are going on in our world and sending that information into the brain so that we can decide how to appropriately turn on or off systems that help us match the moment. And we also have incoming input from our bodies. So the lower parts of our brain where these core regulatory networks originate are continually getting information that monitors your internal state and it monitors the external state. And when there is any incoming information that suggests that you are potentially under threat, the brain can basically recruit systems that it needs to meet the moment you know, let's actually, let's get your body ready to move. Uh, let's increase your heart rate. Let's mobilize, make your muscles get ready to, to act. And let's shut down parts of the cortex that are sitting around contemplating, you know, the meaning of life. Because right now, when there's a saber-toothed tiger pacing outside the, my, my campfire, I don't need to think about the future of humankind. I need to think about the moment. Now, this is one of the great capabilities and important elements of state dependence. Your brain has the capability to get input from all of these uh, sensory domains and tell you whether you're safe and, and tell you if you're regulated, you have enough food, you have enough water, and if you are, if you're in an environment where you're safe and it's a fam familiar environment and there's no significant need that's unmet, you can use this really smart part of your brain and you can be inventive and creative and reflective. And this is one of the great characteristics of our species. Now, what happens, however, is that when you start to get threatened and you feel as if your body is challenged, you start to change the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you behave. And this is a reflection of state-dependent function. And the more threatened you get, the more you shut down the thinking part of your brain, the more you become reactive. And this is a really important point because what you'll find is that people who are under a lot of duress who become increasingly anxious and activated, they also become increasingly less rational. And sometimes their solution to the current problem will be what you and I would call irrational. And so, or overly emotional, overly reactive. And so this is something that many of you I think have seen uh, maybe in your families or in your workplace or in, in watching things on the media. A key thing about the current situation, and it goes back to the, what I mentioned earlier, that you know we have these systems that can basically recruit and activate all of our body and brain and prepare us for threat. And so what happens, one of the first things that happens is is that you, you become externally focused and vigilant and maintaining vigilance for a long time actually is emotionally and, and physically draining. And activating, making your body sort of be ready for threat all the time, for a long time, it, it exhausts your body too. And one of the key things that we're gonna see in this current pandemic is emotional 
and physical exhaustion. People will not be able to do as much work during the given workday that they normally did. Students will not be able to learn as rapidly or as efficiently as they had in the past. And this is really an important thing to be aware of and to be really gentle with yourself and with others. And I would recommend even proactively decreasing your own workload in anticipation of exhaustion because it's a lot better to proactively and intentionally decrease what you have to do than to say you can do something and expect yourself to do it and fail and then beat yourself up and let other people down. So it's important that we are proactively anticipating less effectiveness. Now, let's walk through this a little bit more. Here's our simple brain heuristic. You've got the upside down brain here. Uh, if you simply tip it on its side, and you can kind of create the beginnings of a table. And we're going to walk you through a bunch of tables uh, to show how people move and change their functioning as they uh, go up the arousal continuum. And so let's start right here. If you are calm and you are not threatened in any way and you have no demands on your attention, and you can be reflective and abstract. And th the truth is, this is a state that not a lot of us spend too much time in because most of us are pretty busy. You know, we're, we're over scheduled. We've got, you know, our phone's always going off. We're watching television. And so we're always kind of in this semi alert state. And if we get into the high alert state here, our behaviors start to shift. We don't, we're not really creative. We can certainly take in new information, but we are not really manipulating it in creative ways. We're just kind of putting it in our head and storing it for later. Now, one of the traditional behaviors that it takes place when you start to feel yourself escalating is that you're going to basically flock. And what flock means is that, is that when you're in an active alert state or a low alarm state, your brain looks to the relational milieu. It looks to the other people in the room, the other people that you're around, your friends, your family, your coworkers, and you look at, did you hear that the same way I heard it? How are you handling the situation? And we are very contagious to this social uh, milieu. And flocking is something that a lot of you probably caught yourself doing by watching the news in excess and calling this friend and that friend and reaching out and 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 getting the same piece of information through five different people and it's a very you know it's a very normal thing to do but it also is indicative if you catch yourself sort of flocking it's indicative that you're getting dysregulated and i think it's something to be aware of and you're certainly going to see it in lots of people uh, that you work with another key characteristic of sort of moving down or, or moving up the arousal continuum uh, is that your sense of time begins to collapse. So again, over here, when you're reflective, you can think about the past, you can think about the future. When you kind of get into this active alert state, you're really concerned about your next appointment, the next phone call, the next Zoom conference you're going to have with people. And when you get really threatened, your sense of time literally collapses. Now, the reason that's important is that one of the things that human beings are really good at is thinking about the consequences of their behavior. What's the consequence of making a new rule in your organization? What's the consequence of going to the grocery store and buying three months worth of toilet paper? That impulsive behavior really has consequences for other people. And it, it is basically kind of an irrational move uh, so there's lots of examples of irrational behavior that takes place when people are in this alarm state. And it, 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 one way to think about it is essentially that the further you escalate up, the more you basically have what we call state-dependent regression. You act less and less and less like an adult and more and more and more like a child. And sometimes you can get to the point where you regress to the point where you're completely self-referential, you don't care about anybody else, you just care about your comfort, you want your needs met and you want them met now, and you are petulant, you're hard to reason with, 
you're emotional and reactive in the way you do things, and that's basically a regressive manifestation. And and it's it's again, those of you who know much about the brain or brain development, you know the brain develops from the bottom up, and as you go from the top up and you develop, you develop cortical capabilities, your cortex gets stronger, you develop executive functioning capabilities, and uh, you're able to be like a mature adult. But the more you get threatened, the less access you have to your cortex and the more you basically functionally regress. This is something that you're going to see uh, in a lot of the folks that you are interacting with uh, under these current pandemic conditions. Final thing here about this uh, state dependent shift using this these charts, there'll be ch changes in behavior. People will basically, you know, depending upon the way what their uh, adaptive choice is, you know, different people have different ways in which they cope with threat. And that's a if you're interested, you can read some of our work and learn more about that. But by and large, people, there are some people that are going to be hyper vigilant and, like I said, scanning the environment for more information, looking at what other people are doing and responding to. And they'll, if you get more threatened, you tend to be resistant to change, to recommendations, to suggestions. You can get openly defiant and aggressive. And if you are dissociating, you'll basically go down this continuum. Now, I, I don't have a time to go into this, but the vast majority of us are kind of in this point right here. We are basically robotically compliant with what we're told to do. Uh, we're anxious. Uh, we're, we're trying to uh, be avoidant of conflict or more distress. And uh, to some degree, being in a, an inescapably distressing situation will predictably cause people to use dissociation as a major coping mechanism. And thankfully, if leaders are providing quality recommendations, if you, and you are anxious and compliant, that can lead to good things. The problem is we need to rely upon the leaders to give us good information and good recommendations and good direction. And that's where some of the problems can come from. If our leaders are making decisions based upon threat-related cognition, their recommendations are not going to be fast enough, they're not going to be reasoned enough, they're not gonna be future-oriented enough, and they're gonna be focused on the moment. And frequently, and, and I hate to say it, but I think some of the decision-making made by many governments in the last month or so have reflected this kind of thinking. Um, in the same way that individuals exhibit state-dependent functioning, so do organizations. And these organizations can be anywhere from a, a country to a state to a county to a business to a family. But when you have a group of human beings that live and work together and they're in a resource surplus and predictable environment, the prevailing affective tone is calm which means that more of the people in that group are going to be able to be abstract and creative, which means that they're going to be more future oriented, which means that they're going to have a whole variety of recommendations, rules, policies, and supervisory practices that are healthier. But if you're in a typical bureaucracy, it's already resource limited and life is generally unpredictable because you don't know who's going to get who's going to be the new administrator, who's going to get elected. And so the prevailing tone of bureaucracies is anxiety. And, and there's a lot of concrete, simplistic rules. This is the way we've always done it. This is the way we're going to do it because we've always done it that way. And, and part of what happens is when you have any group, whether it's a family living on the margins and having relatively unpredictable resources, or a bureaucracy that's functioning on a, this resource limited, unpredictable in circumstance, like most of our state agencies, or you know, if any any individual, any group of people that are sort of on the borderline like this, including not for profits, when we push them into this fear place we're gonna see all kinds of unhealthy behaviors that are institutional and 
uh, what I fear is that more and more of our families, more and more of our organizations, more and more of our state uh, agencies are going to be in this resource limited, unpredictable, and uh, extremely novel situation. And, and of course, when that happens, the families that are living on the border end up over here. And a big concern for a lot of us in the field is if you're a family that's living on the margins and, you, and, and you've barely got enough to live month to month and there's all kinds of pressures on you and all of a sudden you lose your job and you can't leave the house and you're in a small apartment with three kids who have to be homeschooled and you're in a somewhat sort of a lousy relationship and everybody starts functioning in a fear-based way, you're gonna get all kinds of increased risk for domestic violence, child abuse, and, and other things. And then this is really one of my major concerns during this is that our most marginalized families that are living most on the edge are gonna get pushed out of this, this yellow category and fall into this red category. We can talk some more about that in future presentations. Uh, those of you who found this helpful, please feel free to share it with anybody. Uh, we have some more resources that we've posted on this website. Um, we recognize how, uh, that it, you know, you took 20 minutes of your time to listen to this. We hope that it's been helpful. Um, there's a, there are places where there are much more uh, eloquent and fully developed explanations of all of these concepts. And you can find a lot of that stuff on these websites. And uh, we, we wish you luck in your work and we'll be providing more of these uh, over the next weeks that hopefully, collectively, they'll be able to help you in your work and help you teach other people about some of these concepts. So take care of yourselves uh, and keep up all of the great work that you're doing.